The sea is only the embodiment of a supernatural and wonderful existence. It is nothing but love and emotion. It is the living infinite. The globe began with the sea, so to speak, and who knows if it will not end with it. In it is supreme tranquility. Ahoy and welcome! Today I'd like to invite you to take a perch and prepare yourself for a schooling, because it's time for another foray into science. What better a target for our intrigue than Subnautica, a survival game that splashed onto the scene in 2018? It provides an experience both beautiful and terrifying, but what really makes the game unique is the detail that's gone into crafting the alien life that populates the planet. With options to collect PDA data, interact with creatures, and take in every beautiful frame, the sea life makes for a play that is both immersive and submersive. Now it's something that happens to the best of us, ending up the sole survivor of a spaceship crash, stranded on a remote ocean planet overflowing with space oddities that want nothing more than to snack on your soft human flesh. I think we can all agree that there's one skill absolutely vital to your survival, an ability without which you'd be powerless against your quickly approaching and gruesome fate. I mean, of course, the ability to discern how the native life evolved into their current forms. Yes, today our focus will be on evolution, that wily mistress. Now, as widespread a concept as evolution is, it would be remiss of me not to make sure we're all on the same page. Evolution is easy, right? Yes? The basic idea that species change over time to better suit their environment is pretty straightforward. But the devilfish is in the details. That's where the waters tend to muddy, so let's go over a few things. Evolution is the theory that all life on Earth, and for our purposes, 4546b, changes and develops into different species as the result of minuscule changes over vast stretches of time. Minute changes built up over thousands and millions of years and created the diverse kingdom of life we know today. Now there's a lot to understand there. First, I can't stress enough that evolution is extremely slow and incremental. It doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen to a single member of a species. It only happens through reproduction, and slight changes in each offspring that proliferate through the gene pool via generations of reproduction. Second, you may have heard the phrase, survival of the fittest. This is a great summarine, but it's often misconstrued. It doesn't mean the most physiologically superior will survive, rather it literally means whatever fits best in a given environment will survive. Adaptation, that is, the changes we're talking about, may be ugly as all hell and a bit of an inconvenience, but if it serves as a specific advantage in a given environment that can give our animal an edge over the competition, then that makes this ugly animal the fittest baby. Last, but not least, Evolution is random. It doesn't happen by a conscious effort or as a response to the environment. It happens by sheer chance. Tiny genetic mutations lead to new expressions that might hold some advantage. If it does, that mutation carries on to the next generation, slowly proliferating the gene pool. However, they also might not be advantageous. They might make things way, way worse. In which case, the animal carrying the trait likely dies, failing to pass on its genes, and thus the disadvantageous trait is gone. Because evolution at its core is the gain or loss of traits, it can all be used to track the relationships between different species and it culminates in the theory that all animals evolved from a single common ancestor. Thus, we can link them all together. For example, a salmon, gecko, and raven are all very different, but they did have a common ancestor at some point. Our first hint is the shared trait of laying an egg. We can organize these connections and differentiations using a kind of chart called a cladogram. For the animals we just listed, our cladogram would look like this. Each prong is used to differentiate a species. The places where the lines meet show a common ancestor, and each diverging line represents a trout. I mean trait. Man, I gotta do more to anchor this video in reality. <laughs> so our traits, in this case, could start with breathes air going from fish to gecko, and has feathers going from gecko to raven. There are, of course, a lot of other traits that set the two apart, but we're going to keep things relatively simple for today. We have to, because who are we to believe we can fully dispel the shroud of mystery Mother Nature veils the deepest reaches of her ocean in? Wade in too deep in the very act of gropering that forbidden knowledge is an insane rush into the grips of sheer terror. So let's get into it. Now, if we want to place all of Subnautica's critters onto a family tree, our first step is sardine them into groups of creatures that could conceivably be related. Here are our shoals. These shoals represent creatures that could potentially have recent common ancestors, determined either by the information provided by our PDA and game, or by shared traits like the shape of their body. In our cladogram, these will become clades, groups of closely related creatures. Based on the traits we know of, these clades would wash out something like this. 
you might take one look at this and feel as if you're lost at sea. However, if we simply track the progression of traits, all will be revealed. Let's start simple. Down here at the bottom, we have our unknown originator species, likely a salty little bacteria overflowing with aspirations. Just above that, our cladogram splits into three. The amoeboid and floater. They haven't progressed much since the reign of single-celled organisms, so they hang out down here while everything else develops a skeleton or exoskeleton. This section, piece of crab cake. Now this next clade is also easy. It contains the hoopfish and spinefish, two very similar creatures that have adapted to different environments. This spot in the center is called a node, and it represents the last common ancestor. At some point, this ancestor's population likely got split between the two biomes and each developed into different species. Fun fact, this is called allopatric speciation. Allopatric meaning divide and location, and speciation meaning the development of new species. This happens a lot on 4546b. Alright, we're bumping up the difficulty a little bit here, but you can take it. I call this the CrossFit clade because everything within shares the same body type and could kill me. We begin with the lava lizard, a predator adapted for the lava lakes. It's got a pretty prehistoric look, so it may have evolved earlier than the rest of its family. Splitting from here, we have the stalker, a shallow water predator, and the gary fish, which alien god apparently made to die. Every food chain needs something at the base, though. We salute this brave man's sacrifice. A very unique trait is then gained, a chitinous hide that acts as armor, seen on the gasopod and the bone shark. There are a lot of dangerous carnivores in this clade, all of similar shape and size. I'm sure you've noticed that there's no overlap in their habitats. This is by design. Any biome only needs one top predator, but they all can exist in harmony by being the apex of different areas. Look at you, Gobi. You're really getting good at this. So I'm confident you're ready for this next group, the Manta clade. This one has an odd arrangement. To start, we have this four-pronged split containing the magma, ghost, jelly, and rabbit ray, who stemmed from a single common ancestor known as the alpha ray. Now, you may be eyeing the magma and ghost rays, which are clearly reskins of the same base and thinking, those must be much more closely related to each other than the rest of the rays. Could this be another case of allopatric speciation? But the PDA in-game states that all these rays are equal offshoots of the alpha ray. Which is stupid, frankly. Do they understand that they're challenging not only the ocean itself, but also the Grand Mistress of Science? This is by far the worst sin of the creators. While I admire their craft, my devotion to science stokes an inner storm. But it's within the game's text, so it is gospel. Still, good on you for catching that bit of speciation. You understand how things should be here, and I applaud you for it. There's only one more branch in our manticlade, leading to the bladderfish and hoverfish. These are likely distant relatives of our more traditional rays, as both share the body type consisting of a fatter, slug-like middle with winging appendages growing outward. We can also see this pattern of outward-extending cartilage or appendage shared with the jelly ray, so this could be assumed as a shared internal structure among the entire clade. Now let's get into one of my favorite clades, the serpent clade. The main features here are a long main body unit propelled primarily by a tail, few if any appendages, and an aggressive tendency to splash out at anything in their general vicinity. We start off here with another example of allopatric speciation in the biter and blighter. On the next branch, we see the same short and pudgy body type, but with the addition of hypnotic fins to create the mesmer. It's possible that these structures could be more like antennae, considering the rest of the clade's lack of flippers, though. The next trait we see develop is an elongated, snake-like body. Thus the clade name, because this is where most of our snaky boys live. This node here is likely where the snake body developed. Then, depending on the environment, it would have evolved into the ampial, crab snake, and an unknown long boy that inhabited the Lost River and Deep Sea Caves at some point. This ancestor proceeded to split into the River Prowler to fill the predatory niche, and the Ghost Leviathan to exploit the microorganisms present in the Deep Caves. Something I want to address quickly is how close things seem when we look at a cladogram. Keep in mind, each of these little splits represents millions of years of evolution and probably more than just one or two unknown ancestors. Before we get into our finnal branches, I want to take a look at three creatures that don't really have any recent ancestors. First, we have the Sky Ray, which, according to the PDA, shares very little DNA with other rays. I hate this. This game continues to fail me when it comes to Discus Fish. Get your ship together, Subnautica. Second, the Reefback is incredibly unique. While it does share tentacle propulsion with part of a clade we'll be looking at later, the rest of its traits are so strange that it doesn't seem to have any close relatives still surviving. Third, the Warper can't exist within our tree because it's not naturally occurring. Rather, it's a completely constructed organism created by the Precursors. As such, it didn't really evolve. Those three are all by their lonesome, but our next two families are Titanic. We're finally going to take a crack at the crustacean line, and you'll never guess why it's called that. 
This clade's disposition towards scavenging and parasitism starts early with the lava larva. These little menaces are probably more ancient than most other critters on 4546b, as their digestion of pure thermal and electrical energy resembles the consumption habits of some cellular organisms. We come to a major fork in the next road, and the shorter path leads us to the microscopic rock grub. While initially it seems far removed from anything else in the game, the PDA confirms this little guy to be a distant relative of the sand shark. Snowballing from there, when we look at the behavior, body type, cranial fin, and double eyes of the sand shark, and mix them with the elongated mandibles of the rock grub, we find a likely family member in the Reaper Leviathan. Eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that these two predators have the same body shape as our crossfit clade. Does that mean they should be closely related? Not necessarily. This is likely convergent evolution, which means the same trait developed independently because it worked so swimmingly. The other side of the fork sticks more closely to the lava larva shape with the bleeder, another parasite with three distinct mandible-like appendages. A similar adaptation is seen in shuttlebugs, still referred to as mandibles while surrounding a three-pronged mouth and supported by three legs on its back end. This leg trait is eventually carried over to the sea treader, another peaceful scavenger. This is also the point where the branch has developed a full exoskeleton, which leads us to the final trident, containing the crabbiest denizens of the sea, the cave crawler, blood crawler, and crab squid. Yet again, we see allopatric speciation in the crawlers, whereas the crab squid evolved to become the top predator of the blood kelp and grand reef biomes. We've reached the final plunge now, the last clade whose namesake is an old friend, the peeper. Yes, the creature that kicks off the final tendril is a distant relative of our peeper, known as the alpha peeper. We don't know a whole lot about it, but we do know that the Reginald, Spadefish, Peeper, and I.I. all originated from this ancestor. And that last one, also a product of allopatric speciation, producing the red I.I. too. Seeing as this subspecies has a red body, a single forward-facing eye, and lives in cave systems, it's likely a distant relative of the Crashfish, who never gets invited to family reunions because he always blows up over the littlest things. Another offshoot of the I.I. is the boomerang family. And say it with me, the red boomerang is a product of allopatric speciation. Returning to the spadefish for a moment, we see the caverns in the body and the arrowhead again in the holefish. Finally, let's return once more to the peeper. The jelly shroom caves give us an offshoot that has developed tentacles for locomotion. This is a vital trait as it connects it to a very, very distant relative, the sea dragon. Like very far removed, 20,000 leagues removed. Okay, it's uh, possible that the Jelly Shroom Caves were once connected to the deeper sea caves, allowing for a common ancestor of the Oculus and the Sea Dragon to separate long ago in their evolutionary history. Done. We do know of a very close relative of the Sea Dragon, though, the Sea Emperor. With strikingly similar bodies, appendages, eye arrangements, and antennae, these two could be called sister species. One gained intelligence, and the other just got really scary. And the intelligence of the Sea Emperor may lead us to the last fish on our list, the Cuttlefish. However, the PDA does state that the cuttlefish is possibly genetically modified or a creature hailing from another world, so its kinship to the Sea Emperor and everything else is dubious at best. And with that, we've charted the entire evolutionary tree for every creature within Subnautica. Crazy, isn't it? Thinking how all these creatures could be connected, how environments shaped each aspect and lined them up in the food chain. The ocean is the origin of life on our planet. Its clandestine reaches are comparable to the farthest reaches of space. Yet, Subnautica leaves us with a chilling notion. We may learn to explore the stars. We may even master them. But the ocean will still be a mystery. There will never be complete safety there, as the shadowy goliaths and hungry hordes threaten to extinguish us. Yet we're drawn in by that unparalleled beauty, seduced by fatal attraction. Can you tell I'm scared of open water? Anyway, I hope you found that diluge of information entertaining. Subnautica is absolutely ripe with scientific intrigue, and there's a lot that can be learned from the thought and care put into it. If you enjoyed this journey, why not leave a like or a comment? And if you want to see more, check out our other videos and subscribe to the Digital Dream Club. I hope you learned something today, but for now, let's wave goodbye.